Hey guys, it's your Peacekeeper coming at you with the next video in our How to Play series on the U.S. Cruiser Line. This is the Tier 3 St. Louis Class Cruiser. There were three St. Louis Class cru Cruisers completed. They are the USS St. Louis, the USS Milwaukee, and the USS Charleston. The St. Louis Class Cruiser is a protected cruiser design based upon the USS Olympia, except that the decision was made to increase the displacement to 10,000 tons from 6,000 tons. To increase the speed of the St. Louis class, a new power plant was utilized, and 8-inch guns were dropped in favor of lighter 6-inch guns. The ships would be reclassified twice in their history, once from a protected cruiser to a semi-protected cruiser, and then to a heavy cruiser in the 1920s, in compliance with the new naming conventions used by the U.S. Navy at the time. The semi-protected cruiser moniker comes from the thin belt armor in addition to the protected cruiser style turtleback armor scheme. And the reason for that was because there simply wasn't enough belt armor there to classify them as a true armored cruiser. Here we can look in the armor viewer and you can see it's got, you know, it's got four inches of belt armor. But if we take away all of these layers here, we can see the turtleback armor scheme here. There it is for you to look at. All three of these ships were built between 1902 and 1906 and would serve into World War I. The USS St. Louis bounced in and out of reserve fleet status in the early 1910s and was later recommissioned as a subtender based out of Pearl Harbor. The crew of the St. Louis would board the German sloop gear in Pearl Harbor to prevent the scuttling of the ship. What had happened was is the ship had been parked into Pearl Harbor and they... The crew of the St. Louis found out that they were planning on scuttling the ship in the harbor to prevent its capture at the outbreak of the war, and so they boarded it and prevented the scuttling of the ship. During World War I, she spent her time on convoy escort duty, escorting convoys from the U.S. to Europe. After the war, she spent time caring for refugees from various conflicts throughout the Mediterranean Sea. The USS Milwaukee, like St. Louis, bounced in and out of reserve fleet status until World War I. During World War I, she was assigned to a destroyer division as a tender for them. In 1917, Milwaukee sailed to Eureka, California to assist in the salvaging of the U.S. Navy submarine H-3, which had run aground in Humboldt Bay. During the attempt, she beached herself, and attempts to salvage her failed, and she was decommissioned in place. A storm in November of 1918 broke the ship up in two and sealed her fate. She'd be struck from the Naval Registry just a year later after that happened. The USS Charleston spent her early years on diplomatic missions around the world. Just prior to World War I, she was stationed in the Panama Canal Zone as a subtender for the subs operating in the area. During World War I, she patrolled for commerce raiders and acted as convoy escort and troop transport operating between the east coast of the U.S. and Europe. She'd be stripped down to her waterline and sold, and her new operator kept her around as a breakwater for a logging company well into the 1960s, when the hull actually took on water and sunk. In terms of in-game gameplay, man, this is where the U.S. cruiser line actually gets good. The, you know, the Chester before it was so frustrating to play. This ship is light years better. It is a solid ship all the way around. It's tough as nails. It is accurate and it is bristling with both main battery six inch guns and secondary three inch guns. The ship is relatively maneuverable. However, her slow speed means careful planning in Tier 4 fights on large maps is critical to playing her well and getting the most out of her. She's an awful lot like the U.S. standard battleships with the 21 knot top speed, except for she's a little bit quicker than that. Just a hair. And so it has very much the same play style without all of the ridiculousness of playing a battleship. She also frequently sees Tier 4 matches with carriers and has basically no anti-aircraft defense, and that makes her very susceptible to carrier strikes. Let's talk about her in-game stats. She has 29,500 hit points, up to 4 inches of belt armor, and her main battery consists of 14 6-inch guns. Yes, you heard that right. 14 and 18 3-inch secondary guns. 
Your main battery firing range is 10.4 kilometers. Your secondaries out to two and a half kilometers, and that's without advanced firing training on the captain. That obviously would get bumped out just a little bit further with it. The reload for the main battery is eight seconds, and you have a 7% chance to start fires, although it definitely feels like the ship starts fires much easier than the Chester did. In terms of anti-aircraft guns, she does have eight 30 caliber Hotchkiss Mark I machine guns that do a whopping 12 damage per second at one kilometer in range. So the, the aircraft basically have to be on top of you in order for your AA to kick in. Her max speed is 22 knots, but the real key to her is her 450 meter turning radius with a 6.4 second rudder shift time. Her detection range by sea is a okay 10.7 kilometers and her detection range by air is 6.3 kilometers now i bring up the detection range by sea as being okay and it's because it's her main battery is just barely shorter than it and it'd be nice to have just a little bit more range when getting up tiered into the tier four fights that the ship frequently sees in terms of upgrades The upgrades are going to be Main Armaments Mod 1 for the reduction in incapacitation of your main battery and to give your main battery more hit points and decrease how long it takes to repair them. And then Propulsion Systems Mod 1, this is going to reduce the chance of your engines becoming incapacitated by 20%, as well as decrease the time it takes to repair the engine by 20%. But enough of me blabbing on, let's get to that battle video. All right, so this battle is a tier three fight, and it is on islands, if I remember correctly. And it's like 54,000-ish damage. So while not a huge number, at least from the standpoint of, well, are we going to get to see some real damage numbers done? Well, not <laughs> not right away anyway. We, a little bit difficult at these lower tiers to get the high damage numbers that we come to expect at the later tiers, but we certainly are get, seeing the progression of how these ships are getting more and more lethal. I want to say the Chester video was, what, 31,000-ish? So we're definitely getting up there in terms of the lethality of this. And this match was just a really good match in general. It started off real rough for our team. In fact, you'll see about the halfway point, one of the guys on the red team was giving us a little bit of grief about feeding him all sorts of XP. But we turn it around at the end, and this comes out to be a victory for us. Now, it's islands, so there's not a whole lot of strategy to this, but... You know, my recommendation was to go meet in the middle and kind of push through to theirs. That ends up not really being what happens. I'm going to kind of take that route, and there's a good reason for that. There's a lot of islands there that I can hide behind, and it's going to allow me to stay in cover long, and, and as well as mitigate how much damage I'm taking from other ships. But like I said, the other... You know, at the first part of this, the other big thing that you got to keep in mind is that you only have 22 knots for your top speed unless you're running a speed flag. And at 22 knots, it takes a long time to cover large distances. And there is a much higher likelihood that I will get in a fight with more targets if I am in the middle of the map for good or worse, you know, for better or worse there. If I'm there in the middle and I can change my direction from there, whereas if I stay up at the top of the map, if they all go to the bottom of the map, which is kind of what they end up doing, it it ends up not working out for us. And you'll see in this video, you'll see one of the more important aspects of this, and that's knowing when and when you can and cannot shoot AP at ships. In fact, you'll see me do like 11,000 ish damage to a Caledon and it was just, it was glorious. It was one of those damn moments. All right, so we got a Chikuma kind of sailing broadside to us. So this first salvo went out as HE. I'm going to switch to AP. I've been detected this whole time, but uh, for some odd reason, I wasn't able to locate the destroyer that was actually spotting me, and that's because he was up north. He took out one of our destroyers by torpedo, Here's our Wakatake getting in a fight with uh, Mr. Ragnar here and his wicks, and he ends up eating a torpedo. Not a whole lot going on at the very beginning of this match, because most of their ships are in the south. I don't have any good spotting to kind of bring them out. And so 
I'm detected by ships that I can't even see or shoot at, and they are shooting at me. And it's kind of a rough place to be at the start of a match. So once again, we love, we've got HE loaded up because I was going to fire at that uh, Wix, but uh, he, he disappeared. Managed to get a fire started on that Chikuma, which is a good thing because he's going to burn for a little bit. He, he had his engine get knocked out on my first salvo, and so this... That second salvo that started a fire on him, he's going to eat the full burn on that. Or at least near the full burn of that. You'll see there that I shot into the smoke there where he was last seen at. I was kind of praying that maybe he was just hanging out there. Uh, obviously a miss, so that didn't work. One of the disadvantages to the U.S. cruiser line, and this ship will definitely introduce it to you in a really hard way, is that the shell arcs are insane. Okay? Uh... It's so insane that you can lob shots over these rather tall islands if this was in... Well, if this was a tier 10 fight and I wasn't in a St. Louis, uh, you wouldn't be able to shoot over that island and hit the targets on the other side with, say, a Hindenburg or a Zhao if your shell arcs are simply too flat. But this is definitely a good trainer for that. Uh, Cleveland, I think, is the better trainer for shell arcs if you're looking to, to practice shell arcs. But here we are, we, we've come out and we've got some targets that we can actually engage now. And we got the St. Louis out here that we're going to go ahead and engage. You'll notice I'm still using HE and that's because the AP on St. Louis doesn't have enough pen to get through the side armor on the St. Louis as well as into the Citadel. So what ends up happening is, is you don't do a whole lot of AP damage up against protected cruisers like St. Louis and Bogatir. I think Dresden is also a protected cruiser design, although AP seems to be mildly more effective against the Dresden and the uh, Emden, which is the German premium tier two or tier three cruiser. Uh, so here's a Kohlberg. Maybe it was Kohlberg that I'm thinking of. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. It's any of the protected cruisers, you, the AP doesn't have enough oomph at range to really to get to, through and actually citadel them so you end up actually doing less damage with ap than you would if you shot he at them so shooting he is just in general more reliable damage wise there's 1400 damage i mean we're up to 15,000 damage already and the server average is 24 if i remember correctly and so you can see it it, it really does help to to know when to use certain different uh, shell types. In this case, we are sticking to HE pretty religiously while avoiding the use of AP simply because of the fact that it just doesn't do enough damage to really justify its use. Uh, 20,561 is the current server average for damage. So we got the St. Louis here and we're just going to keep engaging him. I mean, we're, we're playing kind of at our max range and there's a good reason for that. It gives us a lot of time to react to enemy shell fire and because we are down so many ships that I just don't feel comfortable putting myself out there to, you know, I take fire, I guess is a, a, an okay way to word that. I, I'm just, I, I'm not, the ship isn't designed to tank damage, so I'm not going to try and tank damage. We are going to kill that St. Louis. Down he goes. Now we got a choice. Well... This Wix here has been a thorn in my side since the beginning of this, so we're going to shoot at him and get him out of this match. Because you do have so many guns on this ship, it is really quite effective at taking out destroyers and lightly armored cruisers. The fire chance is pretty good to, to do reliable damage to battleships. You don't have to worry about the Caledon or the Weymouth Syndrome where your AP, you know, it doesn't do enough damage or your HE, well, you don't have HE on those ships, or your, or the Dresden Syndrome or Kohlberg Syndrome where your HE does like 100 damage up against those ships if it does any damage at all. You don't have to worry about that with these 6-inch guns. They pack quite a punch. Mr. Ragnar here has managed to finish off our other St. Louis, so we are going to finish him off uh, out of protest, and it's going to take a little bit. He's actually, uh, he, he played this really well. In fact, it kind of makes me wonder if he watched my, my Wix video, because uh, some of these tactics, uh, it's quite good. I mean, it, it, this is what I'd expect from an upper tier player. 
he gave himself a little bit too much of a broadside there. And simply put, uh, you're not going to take on a St. Louis and a Wix and really get away with it. And what he did there is he launched torpedoes. And I know that because of the way he was angled and because, well, there's the torpedo indicator. So we are turning in. Uh, we are kind of focused on something else at the moment, but we are turning in. Okay, so the torpedo indicators are back. Whoa. And this is where it pays to pay attention to what you're doing. Unfortunately, yeah, we ate that torpedo. So we'll, we'll give him that. That that hurts. That hurts a lot. And that's going to make me a lot more picky and choosy about what ships I'm going to engage into this fight. Especially since we got a Chikuma, a Kohlberg, and the Caledon that are all firing at me. So, also, one of our St. Louis is all the way in the back. Our only other cruiser is all the way in the back. We've got a Samson here that is fighting with this Chikuma. I'm trying to support him as best I possibly can while also minimizing the profile that I'm giving. And our V-25 is off to the south. Okay, so we started the Chikuma on fire. The St. Louis is exposing a really good profile to me, so I'm going to switch to him from that Chikuma. And unfortunately, that means that our Samson isn't going to survive the engagement. However... He does manage to finish the Chikuma off before he gets taken out of the fight. And this St. Louis is really a bigger threat. He's got way more hit points than the Chikuma did. And it's a much better ship than the Chikuma is. And he's also down here shooting at our V-25 and our St. Louis. So I want him out of this fight. Now the match is tilted in the other way. It is now three versus two. And we have had a complete reversal of the teams. If you remember correctly from earlier on, there was a guy thanking us for feeding XP to his Nassau. Well, thanks for feeding XP to me. And uh, our V25 really enjoyed it too because he ends up with a Kraken by the end of this. So this leaves a Caledon that's up north. This leaves the Kohlberg in the south. Now, my hope is, is that I can catch this Kohlberg out and get rid of him before this Caledon becomes an issue. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't end up being that way, and we are forced to engage the Caledon first, which is fine. So there he is. He popped up. Just briefly popped up there between the smoke cloud left by the Samson and from what our V-25 could see. And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to head him off at the pass. This is going to leave this Kohlberg behind us really open to engage us. Okay, so he started to enter the cap. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to blind fire where I think he is. But this is really a really bad guess. It's not like he just disappeared and I was able to guess that. But he, we got quick enough reloading guns. He pops up. Oh, he's way over there. And he's broadside. So we're going to switch to AP right away. You can see we didn't get a very good hits on him. Like, well, okay. So now he's angled into us. Well, Shazbot. Well, I got the AP loaded. We'll just shoot it anyway and see what happens. Damn! <laughs> yeah, so uh, poor Caledon definitely doesn't have strong enough front armor to avoid getting Citadel through the nose by a six-inch AP fire. Noted. <laughs> That that was a huge hit. Just huge hit. Um That's a huge hit for a battleship. I mean that was that was a that was a good hit. I I uh I don't know what to think of it. Alright, so the last ship that's left, and you'll notice that through this entire time, one of the tactics that I've been using has been to kite the enemy ships as they come in. As soon as we make contact, we start to turn away or start to turn towards cover. For instance, in this case, I'm turning towards cover. One, it makes it a little bit more difficult for them to hit us. But two, it really it minimizes our profile and allows us to really abuse the WASD keys to get away from the ship in question. And that's a skill that really is quite necessary for these ships because in spite of the fact that they do really well up close, they simply take too much damage. All of them, all the U.S. ships, simply take too much damage at these close ranges to be really super effective at them. All right, so the Kohlberg's there. Last shot. All right, game in. 
But anyway, I, I, I have a tendency, especially when there's a lot of ships, that you'll see me turn away and kind of kite them because these ships do really well. 52,631 damage, uh, 1,013 base XP, 3 kills. Here's a detailed report and the credits and XP screen. And of course, I'm going to go back and I'm going to compliment uh, Devious Otter and his V25 for doing really well. Uh, anyway, like I said, these ships do really well uh, in terms of kiting. It, it's a it's very strong in that position, and I think that's probably the best way to play them. But you guys let me know down in the comments. Is that the way you'd play it? And if you haven't already, like, comment, and subscribe. And thank you guys for watching.